three, two, one. Hello there, and I'm starting some videos on my channel. Hopefully this video looks decent. It's being filmed on kind of a crappy computer. It's a AMD Opteron 180 dual core. It's basically a AMD Athlon 64 X2 something or other. And four gigs of DDR1 memory. Yep, it is an old computer. Hopefully this video is being coded correctly by the two NVIDIA GTS 250s, but you know, those are still old crappy cards. Anyway, that machine's not the point of this video. Maybe I'll talk about that in another one. The point of this video is rebuilding my old Windows 98 PC from when I was a kid. Or, well, something very similar to it. Um, I tried rebuilding it with similar parts, but it just seems to like crash for no reason and like freeze up for no reason. So today we're going to unbox something I got and see if we can get it to work and set it up in my computer. Hopefully this is okay. I'm using a crappy webcam to film this. Let's see, if where I, let's see where I can put it to film the box. Um, right. Is that okay? Hold on. Oops, spoilers. That's what we're looking at inside this box today. This is an Asus Socket 7 motherboard. Put this out of the way. And... Box. Here we go. Oop, uh, tape there. Come on. There we go. Cut through that tape. And... Since... I could open this box. No, yeah. open the box. There we go. And open the box. There we go. So much tape. Yeah. And look at that. Packing peanuts. A joy. All right. Keep opening this box. Keep opening the box. And. Finally cut through all this tape and dig through all these packing peanuts. Hopefully we can find our prize. Inside the peanuts we have bubble wrap. Oh no. There we go. Oh no, my cell phone. I got a text message. Please ignore that. <laughs> And I'm going to pause this video real quick and we'll cut back to when this is sitting outside of the box. Click. Now we're recording again. Here we have our bubble wrap thing. Let's see if I can move the camera a little bit better. No. Camera. <laughs> um. <Ew. laughs> No, that's worse too. Let's see. No! What uh, USB cable? <sighs> Guess this will have to do. Guess this will have to do. Alright. Alright, enough. Out of tape. All right, let's. All right, bear with me. Here we go. And we almost got it. Read from its bubble wrap. And tape prison. Almost got it. Almost three. Okay, good. So here, as you saw in the manual, is an Asus Socket 7 motherboard. 
with an AMD K6 333. Now, my Socket 7 PC, my Windows 98 PC, was originally a Cyrex MX, uh, Cyrex 6x86 MX PR166. So this is slightly faster than that, and also an AMD variety instead of the Cyrex or IBM branded variety. This being a socket 7 motherboard, has two different two different RAM sockets, the old SD RAM and then the this type of RAM. I forget exactly what the difference is. This being this being a socket 7 board, this has two different types of RAM. Yep, this has SIM RAM and DIM RAM. I forget how much RAM was installed on this board, but I have extra RAM. I have at least 128 megs that I can put in it if it doesn't already have it now. Um, this cooler is powered by Molex, but I do have a cooler that is powered by an onboard fan header that I might use. Um, it's got only an AT keyboard connector. Everything else has to be powered by all the different cards. We have some ISA and some PCI slots. This board might actually even have USB headers on it, as well as some serial headers and stuff, so this should be perfect. And actually, this is an interesting Socket 7 board because... Because this has both an AT power connector and an ATX power connector, that's pretty rare. And by rare, I mean uncommon. Um, I think most Super 7 boards, which were ATX sized, also had that ATX power connector. This is an AT or baby AT sized board. But I guess some Socket 7 boards must have had both. I don't know when they started putting that in. This is probably newer than the board that I had originally, so... Anyway, let's go get the case that's going to be going into and start the process. Ta-da! With the magic of the pause button, we now have a case on the table. This thing is, and if you can see that all, this is a actually Inwin branded case. I bought it on eBay, just branded as generic AT case, but it's Inwin. I've added some parts to it, and let's see. So we have a a three and a half inch floppy drive. 5 and a quarter inch floppy drive, a CD burner, and a DVD-ROM drive. Windows 98 can read and play DVDs, so that should be fine. Around the back we have... This is configured with my current Cyrex PC, but like I said, when it boots up, it just sort of freezes randomly, or when I open programs, it just freezes, so I'm going to be resetting, reinstalling this with that board and seeing what happens. Um, Inside, on the back here, we have the AT keyboard connector, some serial ports, some parallel ports, some USB ports, video card, Ethernet card, a compact flash adapter, a sound card, and just um, an ISA card that adds some more serial and game port cards. Um, so now we're going to open this up, take out the old board, and throw that new one in. I've taken out the screws already, just to make life easier. Off. Actually, this case is pretty interesting. I don't know why a lot of modern cases don't do this, but in this case, this whole tray actually can slide out, and the motherboard screws onto this, and then it slides back in. But first, we need to take out all the pieces before we can slide that out. Tilt this down. See if we can adjust the camera again. Oh, you can see, we can see this here. That's probably the best we're going to get. Alright, let's see. Keep my toolkit. First off, let's pull out all of the ISA and PCI cards. Set them aside. Exciting, I know, isn't it? Watching me unscrew stuff. Hopefully this will be more interesting. If not, I don't know. This is me just experimenting and just doing what I like to do. Building computers, having fun. Figured maybe other people would like to watch or, you know, whatever. Okay, so, one card we have. This is an ISA card. It 
is actually meant for like older machines than this, maybe like 46s, but it adds serial, parallel, and game port. So that way I have multiple game ports, not just the one that's on the sound card. Speaking of which, next is the sound card, which is also an ISA card. It is an Opti 82C931 card. Unplug the CD-ROM cable. And attached to the card is actually a Dream Blaster S2 mid-eye synthesizer. This thing sounds pretty cool. This is just a Compact Flash 2 IDE adapter. The motherboard in here supports, uh, or rather, only supports up to 32 gigs, anything more than that, and the BIOS will not recognize it. Hopefully this new BIOS can support bigger hard drives, so I might even use a actual hard drive, like a 100 gig hard drive, instead of just a 32 gig compact flash card. Oh, forgot to unscrew one of these. The first of our PCI cards is... This, which is just an Ethernet card, it's just 10100. I do actually have a gigabit PCI Ethernet card, but I don't think there's even drivers 98 for that, and gigabit of a PCI is pointless since PCI can't go that fast anyway. Finally is the video card, which is an S3 Savage 4. Very similar to the card that was originally in the computer when I was a kid, but that card had a lot of graphical problems, so I had to replace it. Pull out the slot cover. And finally, just the USB headers. This motherboard has USB ports, but they're USB 1.1 probably. They do a PCI USB 2.0 card I could install if I need more or faster USB ports, but this seems to work for now. Just a serial and game port card. Um, cable for that card. Let's also pull out the IDE cables. Unplug the serial, parallel, CD-ROM, and the AT power connector. And all that unplugged, should be able to just slide, whoop, whoop, unplug the front panel headers, the power button and all that. Actually, not the power button, the reset button and the lights. Since this is an AT power supply, the power button is just directly attached to the power supply, not to the motherboard. See, this just slides out. Why can't all cases be like this? The motherboard is just right here. So let's just move this aside and work on this. Alright, so now we just have the motherboard on the motherboard tray going to be detaching it so I can put the new one on. Right. This, so this motherboard was missing one of the clips on the CPU socket that holds the cooler on, so I sort of MacGyvered it with a binder clip and some wire. It's kind of crappy, kind of janky, but hey, you know what? It holds it on. There we go. Disconnect that. Unplug that. I'm using thermal pads in this machine instead of thermal paste just because it's easier to apply, clean up, and all that. I don't really feel like dealing with cleaning off thermal paste. So I'm probably going to be using this cooler in that system since it connects with just a normal 3-pin fan header instead of Molex. So this actually isn't the Cyrex CPU. The Cyrex CPU is somewhere else. This is actually another AMD K6. This is an AMD K6. 200 and that's AMD K6 233. That one's faster. Well, this one also seemed to do have the same problem where it would just freeze and lock up for no reason. So I don't know if it's any of the CPUs that's the problem or this board. Maybe this board is the problem and that board will solve it. So this board is a FIC VT503. Not quite the one I had as a kid. In my first childhood computer, that was a VT502. 
this is slightly newer, I think. This has got, I think, 128 megs of RAM on it, so I can pull that off and stick that in the other motherboard, or I can just leave the RAM that's already on there, once I see how much it is. This is actually using two DIMM sticks instead of the old SIM sticks. Take the CPU out. Like I was saying, take the CPU out and safely store it in a bag. Just keep it safe. There we go. This is, I said, an AMD K6. Socket 7. Undo some screws. So fun thing about these boards, they're actually all the jumpers on here, like these ones, all have to be set for different frequencies and voltages and all that, depending on what CPU you have. Nowadays, obviously you don't have to do any of that, you just put the CPU in the board and the BIOS figures it out. But I guess you can, you know, change the frequency and the voltage from inside the BIOS, but here, if you don't do that, it won't even boot. You have to tell it exactly what type of CPU it has, or you can kill something or fry something. I don't really think these are very overclockable, so I don't think you'd want to try to, like, over or under volt it or anything crazy like that. Just set it to what the chip says, and you should be good to go. Screw is a little stubborn. This camera angle is okay. Again, it's just a webcam that's sitting on top of a monitor. So, you have to get a real camera, or I, can, I think I could mount this onto a tripod mount, but that's fine. There we go. The old board is removed. So, on a lot of these cases, these old boards had these little plastic pieces here that clip through the board, and they'll slid onto the little pieces in here, and then you screwed the rest on. So there are a few standoffs here that get screwed into, but these also did part of it, so you have to squeeze the plastic here to get these suckers out. There we go. One, two. So this board only has an AT power connector. It doesn't have the ATX power connector. And interestingly, it doesn't have the plastic around the IDE slots like the other board does. So there are a few differences. So hopefully that board works better. We'll see. Let's go get it. So here is our new board, the ASUS board. I'll probably be replacing this cooler with the other one over there, and I'll be putting a new piece of thermal pad on it too. Um, when I bought this, I assuming the jumpers on this are already set correctly, because I can check that in a little bit. But let's put this in the case first. First, let's see if, every, if the um, standoffs line up, or I need to place new standoffs. Luckily, this board seems to be exactly the same size, so the existing standoff should work, along with these existing plastic pieces. Poke this one through here, and poke this one through here. Slide them into the tracks, and then screw it in. back in. Let's use this. This is a nice little tool. It's a little grabby thing. Very useful for grabbing screws, especially once you drop in computer cases. Or for putting screws into screw holes. Luckily I have the manual for this board, so I can make sure I plug all the front panel connectors in correctly, as well as the serial and the USB. I'm guessing this board, like the other one, is also the onboard is USB 1.0 or 1.1, so if I want, I can throw in a USB 2.0 PCI card. I probably will, that would get me more speed from the USB ports, since Windows 98 does support flash drives, so that would be useful. Alright, let's take this cooler off. 
Maybe. How do we get this off? This one doesn't have the same type of clip on it as the other one does. Luckily this board isn't missing any of the plastic clips, so I don't need to MacGyver the CPU cooler on. Pretty good. We got it off. I think the cooler might be sort of stuck to the CPU, so... Oh! There we go. So we got the old cooler off. And... See if I can get it out of the socket here. We have the AMD K6 233. Maybe the camera will focus on it. Maybe it won't. Is it gonna do it? Nope. Come on. Camera. Anyway, AMD K6. 233 megahertz. Should be faster than my original. Cyrex 166. Well, actually, Cyrex used PR 166, meaning performance rating, because they didn't want to actually specify the speed of that CPU. That ran actually about 133 megahertz, and they just said that it was as fast as, or maybe even better than Intel's 166, and they may be right. I didn't do any real tests, but that CPU seemed like it could have probably held up to the Intel 166, or at least that's what Cyrex claims. We're going to use some thermal pad here. Since, again, I don't really feel like using thermal grease on here, this is much easier to just cut a bit off and throw it on the CPU. I can't imagine these CPUs producing that much heat, but I don't want to put the metal of the cooler directly on the CPU. So, very simply, you just measure it out, cut a piece off, and that's it. Well, there's plastic on either side, so peel the plastic off. Stick it on the CPU. And then peel the plastic off the other side and put the cooler on it. Alright, we have our cooler, and let's install it. This looks to be the CPU fan header. That's good. Alright, let's... Clip it onto the sockets. Um, these different sizes on either side or something weird? Come on. I want you to go on there. There we go. Just had to be silly or something. And then push this down, clip it on. Perfect. And we connect this to there. Good. Mm, cable management. Fun. Um. Just sort of stick this cable around the socket there. And it should be fine. Alright. I guess we can connect the serial and the parallel plugs here. Parallel looks to go here, and next to it is COM1 and COM2. Let's make this guy COM1. Next to it, COM2. And this is LPT1. So the red stripe on it, if you can see that, is pin 1, and labeled on the motherboard is a 1. So make sure you have pin 1 lined up with pin 1. And these cables are obnoxious and getting in the way of each other. But let's see if I can get this into where it goes. Alright, those look to be plugged in. 
This here seems to be the floppy connector, and then the two IDE connectors, one for the hard drive, one for the CD-ROM drive, and I'll look in the manual, but one of these pins here, or rather, some of these pins here are for the USB header. So let's get this back in the case. So now, like I said, one reason I love this case is you just take this, and you just slide it on in here. Oh no. Hmm. The mouse from my capture computer is in the way. Like I said, you just line it up with the rails and slide it in. Makes working on it pretty easy. Good. This case is heavy, but at least with the power supply and CD-ROM drive and floppy drives and whatnot. Alright, let's see where if I can figure out where all these header cables go. It's like a lot of them are actually labeled on the board, so... So this board actually has a spot on the front panel connector for a power switch, because if you're using an ATX power connector, you would need that. Since I am using an AT power connector, that would be not plugged in, and instead, the power switch is directly connected to the power supply. One of these cables is the PC speaker to get us nice beeps. Then we have the reset button and the hard drive and power LEDs. Sorry you guys can't see in the case. Here I can move the camera. There we go. You can see there. There's all. There's the front panel power connectors. I don't know why the camera doesn't want to focus on them, but um, there they are, and all these cables have to go in there. So looking at the manual, it turns out the hard drive LEDs are not actually in that block where all the other front panel connectors are. It's actually off to the side for some odd reason. This is an interesting motherboard. So let's move that cable to where it's supposed to go. Um, manual says positive is towards the bottom. So let's make sure we plug that in the right direction. Or, wait, hold on. Let me hold the, this so it lines up with how it looks. And. Yeah, that should be correct. Positive is that way. So interestingly, this motherboard has a Wake on LAN connector on it, and so does the Ethernet card. Though Wake on LAN only works with an ATX power supply, not an AT power supply. Obviously, because the Wake on LAN would be similar to the power button and when an AT power supply is shut off, the power button is directed direct to the power supply, so when the computer is off, the power supply is completely off, so Wake on LAN won't do anything. So, connecting the Wake on LAN cable is kind of useless. Alright, so now let's connect the power cable, the AT power cable. How these work is you want to connect the black to the black, make sure they're facing that way when you plug it into the board. And these only should go in one way, as long as you have them oriented correctly. Connect the floppy drive IDE cable to over there. Lose reaches. Good. This is the CD ROM drive IDE cable, so I'll connect that to. IDE secondary. So as a test here, I'm going to see if 
how much hard drive space the motherboard supports. My old one it only would work up to 32 gigs. If you connected a 40 gig hard drive, it wouldn't work. I had a 40 gig hard drive that had a jumper that made it go to 32 gigs, and that made it work. And with that compact flash adapter, I was using this 32 gig compact flash card. That's fine, that's really fast. I just want to see if I can get something like this to work. This is a 100 gig hard drive. A little crazy for Windows 98, but I think this computer, or this motherboard, might be able to support up to 120 gigs, so this drive might actually work. So on this case, I pick it up a little bit. These rails here, there's another one on your side. That's where the hard drive goes. Sandwich routine there and screwed in. All right, the hard drive is screwed into the case and let's connect its IDE cable. First to the motherboard. Uh, I guess it doesn't matter which way. But this one says system on it, so that goes into the system. And the other side goes to the drive. There are a lot of cables in here. Back when these computers were king, there's no, you know, cable management wasn't really a big deal, or rather, I don't know. Cable management these things is ridiculous. These cases are really annoying to work in. There's never really enough room to get stuff to fit and all that. So, see so if I can get this ID cable in the hard drive. Yep. And connect a Molex power cable to it as well. Alrighty, I checked the manual for how to plug in the USB connector. So let's plug that in. That goes here, making sure I line up the blank pin in the header with the blank pin on the board. And then screw this into one of the PCI, one of the extension sockets. Hopefully, one so I'm not blocking a one of the PCI slots. And screw that sucker in. All right, and now to start connecting PCI cards and ISA cards. Starting with the video card, like I said, the S374 PCI. Ooh, it's a tight fit in that PCI slot. Don't know if it's supposed to be like that, but hey, it's in there. The PCI spacer, expansion slot spacer, in there as well. We have another PCI expansion slot spacer to replace where the compact flash adapter was, since this machine is now using a hard drive compared to a compact flash. Next, we'll connect the Ethernet card. Like I said, this is a 10100 Ethernet card. It works fine in Windows 98. I mean, I'm sure browsing the internet with Windows 98 probably isn't the safest thing in the whole world, but hey, it's fun. And I'm not going to be going to any sites that would get me viruses or anything, so I'm sure it's fine. It means I could probably even play some LAN games or something, you know? Have a little fun with this machine. Put that slot cover in there. And now we move on to the ISO cards sound card. This card I think has OPL3 on it, or at least OPL3 emulation. It's got decent sound blaster emulation and because of this wavetable header I can use this MIDI synthesizer. Put that into the ISO slot. Oh, before I do that, make sure I connect this, the CP CD-ROM audio cable. 
to make sure that I can play audio CDs and that games using CD audio can pass through to the sound card correctly. And for now I'm actually going to leave the other ISO card out. That was because I couldn't get the game part working on the sound card so I added this ISO card to hopefully add another game port. But it also adds another serial port, another parallel port, and I don't want to have to deal with IRQ conflicts right now with the onboard parallel and serial and stuff. So I'm going to leave that out for now. I can add in later if I need it. So I guess I'll have to get two more slot covers. Two more slot covers, put those in. So I haven't checked the BIOS battery on this board, but hopefully it works. If not, I got an abundance of them elsewhere that I can put in, or just take the one off the other board and stick it in this one. So I didn't talk much about the other board. The original board, like I said, was the FIC VT503. I bought that as an upgrade to my 502, and some reasons were because that board didn't like the 128 megs of RAM, and only would support like 64. Um, that board also had one of those stupid Dallas onboard clock chips with the battery built in, and I couldn't replace it, whereas the 503 has a normal CR2032 BIOS battery. This AC Sport also has a normal CR2032 BIOS battery. Anyway, let's see if this board works better, because that other board, like I said, was just randomly freezing when I lo would load up Windows 98 or load any program or anything, and that was a little annoying. Alright, now that this is all together, I'm going to connect the VGA output to this PC that actually has the VGA capture card in it, so we can get direct feed from this. So, let's plug this in and see what happens. Hey there, and we are ready to go! Have the computer connected to the capture card. So, hopefully, if everything is working properly, we can get a VGA output on the screen, as well as me and this webcam. So some changes were made to the computer. When I tried to plug it in the first time, it didn't post. I kind of freaked out a little bit and realized that the video card wasn't installable by. So I took the video card out, put it back in, and it posted. I also had to take out the hard drive. I thought this BIOS could read the hard drive, but it couldn't. So we're back to using the compact flash adapter, which as of right now is not actually connected to well, it's plugged in, it's just not plugged into one of the expansion sockets, it's just loose now. Once everything works, I'll put that back in how it should be. Let's get the compact flash card and stick it in. And power it on. Hopefully, there we go, there's our video card, and here we go. AMD K6, and not a whole lot of RAM there. I guess I can probably put in my 128 megs of RAM and see if that helps anything. But luckily here we see we can detect something as our primary master, hopefully that is our compact flash card, and our two CD-ROM drives are detected. CMOS checked some error, that's fine, that's because I actually pulled out the old CMOS battery and put a new one in as I was testing it for why it wouldn't post, so that is fine. Actually, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to turn this off, swap out to more RAM, and then turn it back on. And then we'll go through the BIOS settings. Alright, and I have installed more RAM. And so let's see what happens. I hear it starting up. Let's see if we get good. There's our beep. K6, 233, and a whole bunch more RAM. Now we're at 128 megs of RAM. We see our sound card is detected by the BIOS. And let's go through the BIOS settings and see what we got. Well, I guess we should fix the date. Today is March 17th. St. Patrick's Day. And the time is 7.23. Good. Our primary master is our compact flash. There's no primary slaves. We can turn that off just to speed up a little bit. 
These are CD-ROM drives. We have a three and a quarter inch drive, and we have a five and a two and a half inch drive and a five and a quarter inch drive. That's this is fine. That's fine. Next, file speaker setup. Cache enabled. Power on this is fine. What's in here? ID is fine. That's good. So it scans the floppy drive and the CD-ROM drive, and then goes to the hard disk. Make sure that works. That's okay. I'm not sure what this does. I could check the manual. That's probably fine. I think this needs to be enabled for Windows. I forget, but I think that is correct. Um, this should be 60 nanosecond DRAM. Yeah, that should be correct. This looks good. Um... This is for if you have the A drive and the B drive swapped around on the cable, like the one that's before and after the twist in the cable. This should be, this is set correctly for how mine is set up. Hopefully the serial and parallel ports are selected correctly. Um, yeah. I'm just going to turn this off for now, and I will go through this later. Windows 90 is in fact that. Auto, auto, auto. Um, I'm just going to leave these the way they are and we'll see what happens. I want a password. Save and exit. Pull this boots up. I'm going to get a DOS floppy disk to make sure we can move from floppy disk. Here we go. It's booting. I hear our floppy drive seeking, that's working. Did you want it in? Good! Oh, right, this is from our old, um, system. This is XF disk, and as you can see, the drive was partitioned a little bit for 98. I left another partition so I could put other OSs on here, like OS2 warp or something. So that's good, that means it can quickly read our drive, our SD card. If I hide this, you can see the information here. Everything looks to be detected up above there. Um, and it looks like we have the network controller also detected. So we're going to boot from a DOS floppy disk just to make sure it works. Put that in there. If I go back to XF disk, or if I hit F1, it'll boot from floppy. I don't know if you can hear that, but it's working and starting MS DOS. Looks like everything is working on this system so far. While there is a uh, installation of Windows 98 on this compact flash, I'm going to be removing that and just starting completely from scratch. Nothing really on there that's terribly interesting, so that's fine. Very good. So if I do C, um, I guess it's like C, maybe it's D? Weird. Oh, I think I know why. I've had this problem with DOS 6. If I use a DOS 7, boot disk. I think that will let me access the drive. Control delete. And our video card. And I should probably check the BIOS version, see if I should update it or not. I don't know if this is the latest one or not, but I will do that later. Alright, good. It's booting from the floppy disk. It detects both our CD-ROM drives, just like the other one did. And... So in case you're wondering, I am just looking at the Bandicam recording screen as, as I'm seeing it through the capture card. Let's see. Perfect. So this can read our drive. This is our old Windows 98 install. There's nothing on here that's super interesting or that I don't already have backed up somewhere, so I'm just going to wipe this out. Hell, I can probably just do it right now from this boot floppy. I'm going to do a quick format because I don't want this to take too long.
S. There we go. And good. Well, that's going up. Oh. One sec, I'm gonna go grab another puppy disc. So I provisioned the disc using XF disc, so I'm just going to fire that up real quick. There we go. So you can see here, this is how I have our disc partitioned. 20 gigs and then 10 gigs about. I might put like OS2 warp or something else here, I don't know. And this is where Windows 98 lives. The boot manager is still installed. That's hopefully in the MVR and not in the partition table. Plus, we didn't change the partition table. We just formatted it. So that should be good to go. Let me quit this. Um, how do I quit this? Oh, F3. All right. If I go back to C, you'll see nothing there. Oh, right here, let's test out one other thing. This is... Well, you'll see what it is once I hit install. This is Retro City Rampage 46. This is always fun to have installed on a DOS gaming computer. That's what this computer is probably going to be used for. Run all DOS games, run all Windows games. The video card here can run DirectX like 7, maybe 8. So, a lot of games should actually run in here just fine. 233 MHz processor and 128 MB of RAM is probably more than enough for Windows 98. This game uses only PC speaker sound, but it's still pretty cool. I've actually had this installed on like a 46 laptop, but obviously this will run it a lot faster, but not really. It doesn't really matter. 46, anything faster. This game runs seem, seems to run just fine on any computer I have thrown it on. And it's almost done installing. I don't know if you can hear the floppy drive or anything. Good. Done. Oh, R C R. Hopefully you can hear that. A PC speaker is definitely working correctly. Seems running at decent speed. Might be a little laggy, but that might be because of watching it through the capture card, not a direct feed from the video card, so... Oh no! Cops, punch, punch. No! Actually, let's go get a car. Cop car! Ow! Oh, give me the cop car. Bye. No! Well anyway, at least it shows that the computer is working now. Next up to be reinstalling Windows 98 and getting everything all set up. Let's quit this. I have another interesting program here I want to run. This is Top Bench, a DOS benchmark. And I just want to see what it says about this machine. has a database of a whole bunch of different machines. So, benchmarking real time. Here's what it thinks this machine is. It keeps pushing between K6 clone, E machine something or other, and back and forth. So, looks like the machine is working just fine or working as well as it could. One of them says here K6233, so at least it's benchmarking as so that's good. 
Looks like that program ports a mouse, but I don't have a mouse plugged in right now. I do have a spare mouse. Just gotta go get it. Once I'm in Windows, I can even use a USB mouse, including like a wireless one. Let's check one other thing. This is called QA Plus Pro. This is just a little program to show us what hardware is inside the machine, just to go through and make sure everything is being detected properly. Oh, you that to load. I'm actually just going to pause this and I'll unpause it once it's loaded. Here we go. The program loaded up and it's analyzing our system. Analyzing hard disks. Go ahead and analyze that compact flash card. Oh, it's doing something. Let's see if it loads. Come on. Analyzing a video. System board. Oh. Loading memory. Boop -a -doop -a -doo. So I think this motherboard actually can support even more than 128 megs of RAM. Might even even be able to support 256, but. I don't have that much RAM on me, so 128 will have to do. CD-ROM device. Wonder if you can realize that one's a DVD-ROM device. Just some schmutz in my table. All right, let's keep waiting for this. Wonder if it is just confused about the DVD device. I don't know why it's just sitting on analyzing CD-ROM device. Normally that doesn't happen. Oh, there it goes. System info. IRQ. I don't know this. I wonder this will show me. Checking for IRQ on devices. Again, I'll have to check if that BIOS version is the latest or not. We are running DOS 7.1, which is correct. Looks like our DMA channels are being used by, interestingly, the floppy drive. And our IRQs look to be used by the COM ports, the floppy port. I wonder why LPT1 says no IRQ, but then again, I don't remember how parallel ports work here. So, this all looks like it should be correct. You can see here, apparently Presto Type is new. Thanks, program. Um, our video BIOS is question mark, question mark, question mark. Which probably is because this card is probably way too new for this program here. But luckily, you can see our floppy drives, our hard drives, our COM port, LPT port. I wonder why it says game port none, but then again, I guess it just might need a game port driver or something, or a sound card driver. It might be able to, might not be able to detect the sound card just on its own. And mouse driver, because there's none plugged in, and I guess I can load up like cute mouse or something, but I don't feel like doing that right now. Just wanted to make sure this whole thing is working before I do anything crazy. Interesting. This can do a whole bunch of other stuff, but that's all. Just want to see if it can detect everything and make sure it's working. So and that's it for now. I'm just going to go and install Windows 98, which is probably nothing terribly interesting. You've seen people install Windows 98 before. I'm just happy that this thing seems to be working, and I will come back soon with another video, and hopefully this was good for you guys. Thank you.